Welcome into the Bubba Rose Show, episode nine. I'm very excited to have this gentleman with us today. I'm, I'm joined by an assistant professor at the University of Southern Mississippi. He is in the sport management department. Uh, welcome into the show, Dr. Chris Croft. Chris, how are you? Good, Bubba. Thanks so much for having me today and look forward to visiting with you. Absolutely. Appreciate your time. Uh, you've accomplished so much and you know, you've know you experienced a variety of things, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on with everything um, going on in the world right now. Uh, you have a background nearly two decades in Division One college basketball, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, but then also uh, academics. Um, obviously, like I mentioned in the intro there, you're assistant professor at the University of Southern Mississippi in sport management and um, teaching students about a lot of the things that are currently going on in terms of the way it's impacting college and pro athletics, so on and so forth. But uh, let's just go ahead and talk about your background. I know you're from Louisville, Mississippi, uh, Mississippi native, and so it's nice to be home for you now. And just talk about uh, your your childhood and your uh, just the importance of athletics in your life and academics, and because it's obvious you pride yourself in being well rounded. Sure. Yeah, I grew up in a small town, uh, Louisville, Mississippi. It is spelled like Louisville, the big city in Kentucky, but it's pronounced Louisville there, and. Uh, it's about 30 miles south of Starkville, where Mississippi State's located, but I grew up there and uh, obviously came from a uh, athletic background. My dad was a pretty good basketball player in high school, and I got a chance to go to Mississippi State at a young age and see a lot of basketball games from the great Jeff Malone basketball player to uh, Will Clark and Rafael Palmer and some of those early great Mississippi State teams with uh, with Coach Ron Polk. So I grew up around it, was exposed to it a lot, um, and getting a chance to play in high school wasn't a wasn't a great player by any stretch of the imagination. I thought I was going pro like everybody else probably does. And then obviously figured out you're not. But uh, I think one thing that was kind of special about Louisville was kind of a, a cradle among coaches. A lot of coaches from that area. Um, uh, Van Chancellor, the former uh, Ole Miss women's basketball coach, uh, Houston Comets, WNBA and Olympic coach is from that Winston County. Uh, Matthew Mitchell, a good friend of mine, uh, obviously a recent head coach at Kentucky women's basketball. Uh, Andy Kennedy, uh, Ole Miss coach, now current UAB coach who has them playing very, very well. Uh, Kim Roseman is from there. She's the current head women's coach at Tennessee Tech. And Mark Hudspeth, who had a couple of uh, football head coaching jobs at Louisiana Lafayette and uh, Austin P. And obviously been a lot of others who have been assistants in college or in high school or head coaching there. So kind of a, a small town and uh, prides itself on a lot of athletics and coaching. And so that's what kind of where I got my start. Talk about that decision. Uh, when when exactly did you know that you wanted to be a coach? Because I know your career path is an interesting one from the fact that you didn't play in college, but you were already pursuing coaching uh, when you went to junior college at, at East Central Community College there in Mississippi. Yeah, quick story on that. I was actually going to go to Mississippi State and go into banking. My mom was in the banking industry, so grew up around the banks all the time. I thought it was kind of cool. They dress up and get to wear nice clothes and kind of work nine to five, nine to four, so to, so to speak and everything. And uh, the uh, local junior college coach, Jay Bowen at East Central uh, Community College came by and was looking for someone to come down and kind of be a student assistant and just uh, a great personality, great charisma and got me to come down to check it out. And obviously I just, I thought it'd be cool, be a, a neat way to kind of transition from uh, being a player to maybe kind of thinking about coaching. So uh, went down there really because of him. Um, I started learning some coaching lessons early. Uh, three weeks after I got there, he left for an assistant division one job. I uh, can't blame him for that. I did at the time. And uh, new coach came in, Marty Cooper, who I worked with. And long story short, we had some really, really good players um, that first year, my first year in college basketball. We won 28 games, all five sophomores signed of senior colleges. So we had a a lot of people coming in to get a chance to meet and uh, visit with people on the D1 and D2 level. So I started making some contacts there, started working some camps and uh, really started liking it. And then uh, the next year was even better. We only won, I guess we would dip down to 24 games. We won a state championship that, that second year, which is the first time in school history in over 50 something years. So I kind of got hooked on it early uh, with having a lot of great success. It, prior to the 93 season, uh, you were able to attend the University of Southern Mississippi and, and work with what is a Golden Eagles legend in MK Turk. Um, Coach Turk was there from 76 to 96. Uh, unfortunately, and we lost him back in 2013 at the age of 71. But Coach Turk won 
more than 300 games with USM. Yeah, great man. So the all-time winningest coach here at Southern Miss and came here and kind of put him on the map and got him in the old Metro back in the day with Florida Metro Conference with Florida State and South Carolina and Cincinnati and those guys and then got him in a conference yesterday. But came down, coach hired me as a student manager and uh, came on board and started taking classes in sport management, which is where I teach now. And uh, as I say, I had the best of both worlds. I learned some stuff in the classroom and the textbook and then I went over to the lab and learn some stuff in practice about what, what what works and what maybe doesn't work. But uh, got a chance to be around some great coaches and Coach Turk. We, uh, my junior and senior year, we we went to the NIT both years. We actually lost the Louisville and the Metro Conference Championship both years. So close to going to the NCAA tournament. But uh, great experiences there. Uh, Coach Turk hired me as his graduate assistant the next year. So I'm 22 years old and assistant a graduate assistant, which that time was a third assistant in NCAA Division One. And that was also our first year of Conference USA. So we were already playing Louisville and Memphis and Cincinnati, but throw in DePaul and um, St. Louis and Marquette and some and some big name basketball teams. So it was a it was a lot of fun and a great learning experience for me at a at a young age, as I say, to kind of be a sponge and uh, sponge in the room and just soak everything up. I noticed um, during uh, one of those seasons, and you you talked about playing in the Metro Conference Championship game against Louisville. Um, you guys made it to the NIT both seasons as well. On one year at Clemson, and the I think the second year at St. Bonaventure, obviously right. out of the A10. But just talk about that Clemson team that you you had um, the opportunity to face, uh, coached by Cliff Ellis, and yep. they had they had Devin Gray, and then also Sher Sharon Wright. Sharon Wright, yeah, very talented team in the ACC. They were, I think, just about 500, but obviously to get a chance to go to postseason. Uh, was a no-brainer to go. And obviously at that time, it was a little more political probably than it is even now. And they took some of the bigger teams, took some other teams that had great names. And, and kind of backtracking back before, uh, you know, Southern Miss had won the NIT National Championship back in 87, which is the only national championship still in the state of Mississippi. So uh, we had a good team, but again, obviously they had a chance to go back to a past champion and someone that they knew in Coach Turk and uh, lined him up with Coach Ellis, who had been at uh, South Alabama before, so had some geographical ties. And uh, we went out there, obviously, they're just too strong in ACC country for us, but, um, you know, great opportunity for us. And we were so close. I remember the, the Metro Conference final game, we were actually playing down in the Mississippi Gulf Coast Coliseum, and it was a, it was a bang-bang game with about two minutes to go. And uh, we came down, I think we missed a three-pointer, and they got a run out basket and came down and we missed another shot and they scored again. So we were, we were about two minutes away from getting to uh, uh, be on, go to March madness, which would have been a thrill of a lifetime for all of us, especially a little kid, but obviously Louisville and Denny Crum and that team pulled out. When I think of Southern Miss basketball, this was just prior to your arrival, but the name Clarence with Weatherspoon, and obviously the first round pick ninth overall in the 92 draft. <laughs> Great player, one of the best time here. Uh, great story coming from a small town and everything and really kind of made himself. You know, he's back here as an assistant coach now. I got a chance to work with my last year in coaching uh, that he was an assistant, but just a great guy. Obviously, great experience in the league playing for Pat Riley and some of the different great coaches. And, uh, you know, he's back here helping our basketball staff with our current head coach, Coach Jay Ladner, who was actually on Coach Turk's NIT team. Earlier, you talked about getting into the lab, so to speak, in, in the gym with Coach Turk and that staff. So what were, um, obviously, you learned a tremendous amount, but a major takeaway or two, uh, give us a Cliff Notes version of some of the, the big things that you learned from Coach Turk. I think the biggest thing, and you start learning this in the business early, is you, you, you try to be fair to everyone, but you can't treat everybody the same because every situation is different. So you have to uh, relate to people and Obviously, um, just kind of like life, uh, basketball players come from very diverse backgrounds, uh, some from two parents, some from one, some from none, inner city, rural, and you're taking a group of people that sometimes you only have one thing in common, and that's basketball, and you're trying to coach them and work toward a championship and have some fun in that way. So I think Coach Turk did a great job of that. He, he, uh, he coached everyone like, he's, like his son. He didn't have a son. He had two daughters, but he coached everyone like a son, and he was there and uh, taught us a lot of life lessons on things that were important that, uh, you know, was going to help us now, but maybe we're not going to make it to the NBA, but help you to be a better dad, a better brother, or, you know, help your kids down the road. So I think that's what you take away from 
uh, those coaches like Coach Turk and Coach Sutton is they're, they're teaching life lessons every day and they want you to be successful, obviously in basketball, but more importantly in the game of life. And that's, uh, I think they're true, they're true, uh, they're true accomplishments that most fans don't really get to see. So take us back there to the mid-90s. Uh, one of the names that's synonymous with college basketball, probably the top 15 all-time successful coaches, is obviously Eddie Sutton. So how did that opportunity arise for you to join Coach Sutton's staff out in Stillwater? Yeah, kind of a unique story there. Uh, I got a chance to, that my last year at Southern Miss, I met Coach Sutton at a Nike clinic in Memphis, obviously 500 people, so we're not remembering everyone, but I met him there. And then we go through the season at Southern Miss and Conference USA. And uh, actually, you know, Coach Turk, uh, Coach Turk was forced into retirement after that season, uh, unfortunate situation, but it happens. But I was with Coach Turk at the Final Four in New York and uh, got a chance to see Coach Sutton again in, in the Nike room, which is kind of coincidence, but we were both Nike schools. And, uh, you know, I'm going through the summer trying to figure out what's going on, finishing up my master's, I still want to coach. And uh, one of the assistants, Robert McInnes, just said, hey, you know, you're young. Uh, you're young and you want to coach, chase the world, uh, you know, chase the dream. You got to get with the big time program. And uh, I still kind of had that itch. And so I, I, I picked schools. I picked 30 schools, uh, East Coast, Midwest, Southeast, kind of Southwest, uh, top notch program. Some other ones kind of geographically located. And I, I just sent a letter and just asking for a volunteer position. That's all I asked for. I got my master's degree wanting to volunteer with your program and uh, learn basketball from you and try to help you win. And I sent that in my resume and, uh, two schools reached out and one was Coach Sutton. And uh, ironically, when he was at Arkansas, him and Coach Turk used to play a lot in Pine Bluff, kind of a neutral game for both. And obviously back to Nike, they were, we were both Nike schools. So at that time, Nike would take all those coaches and their wives on a vacation uh, first week of August. So they got to spend some time like that. So when Coach Sutton saw my letter, he called Coach Turk one to kind of check on Coach Turk and see how he was doing since he was now uh, going to be retired. And then two, he said, by the way, let me ask you about Chris. I got a letter about him wanting to help. And um, I learned later, you know, Coach uh, Turk told me later, he said, I gave you the ultimate recommendation. Um, you owe me, don't mess it up. But he said, I basically told him, I said, Eddie, uh, he could call him Eddie, nobody else really could. But he said, Eddie, if you hire Chris, I promise you the next time you see me, you're going to thank me. And that's all he said. And uh, after that, Coach uh, Sutton reached out and we talked and got out there and visited and uh, fortunate, got a chance to go there. It was two years after their final four run of uh, 95 in big country. And they were creating an administrative assistant spot, kind of like I say, a big brother spot. Uh, they'd had some some minor player issues, this and that. And they wanted someone to kind of live in the dorm and, you know, get a meal ticket and kind of keep their eye and kind of be a big brother to player. So that was that was how I got in and I obviously took it, uh, took it on the spot. No brainer. Yeah, no doubt about it. It's a no-brainer. And you referenced that that team with Oklahoma State, um, big country Bryant Reeves. I remember that run so well. Um, I was certainly hoping the Cowboys would bring home the title that year. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. But and that was a lot of fun to watch. And, you know, Coach Sutton, College Basketball Hall of Famer, unfortunately, we lost him during this pandemic the end of last May at 84 years old. And um, – I saw you, it's interesting, you brought up Arkansas already. During Coach Sutton's time at Arkansas, um, he, he obviously had so much success there before he moved on to Kentucky, but it was Barry Trammell, who's a sports writer with the Oklahoman. Uh, I saw an article in preparation for this interview where Barry Trammell, back years ago, had talked about Coach Sutton and just how genuine he was. He said, when I was an Arkansas fan, and for whatever reason, just my – perception from afar I didn't like coach Sutton but then I had the chance to cross paths with him once he was in Stillwater at OSU and and uh, my my thoughts on him totally changed and um, even though I had grown up an Arkansas fan and an uh, Oklahoma football fan there was no team that I had a deeper affinity for than some of those Oklahoma State basketball teams. No doubt. Just a, uh, a grandfather figure, a legend, obviously finally went in the Hall of Fame way too late, but just someone that walked into the room just had a way of presence about him and uh, uh, raised the level of the room. And uh, obviously great time. I was with him for two years, administrative assistant, and uh, he treated everyone in our program from our secretary to our, our video people to uh, we had some work study girls. 
Uh, he gave you jobs to do and he held you accountable. He didn't micromanage you, but he gave you jobs and he would come around and check to see where they were at. And he made you feel like that job that you had was the most important thing in the program. And we weren't going to be able to be successful unless you came through. And it was uh, amazing how, you know, you get all those people working one direction. Uh, obviously, you know, you got to have players and you got to coach them. He took care of that. But he truly had a cowboy basketball family. And, uh, you know, he re-energized that fan base, had played there, and they'd been through some tough times with football and some probation, some other issues. And he came back and re-energized that fan base, uh, galvanized a double to gallagher Iber Arena and two Final Fours. And the uh, only thing he didn't accomplish was a was a Final Four national championship. But that that doesn't matter. He he made everybody associated with the program better. And, again, that's what that's what coaches, uh, great coaches, Coach Turk and Coach Sutton, that's what great coaches do. With Coach Turk, you talked about um, learning how to treat everyone fairly, but also as individuals. And with Coach Sutton, uh, you talked about how he would delegate. Uh, is that one of the big things you learned from him? What were what were some of your primary takeaways from Coach Sutton with the, with those two seasons? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he had a we had a system. It was in place. They're already winning. They just spent two years from the Final Four, and uh, he just had a system in place. He knew how to make things better. He wasn't afraid to tweak some things and change some things. Um, you know, and he uh, obviously was a defensive minded coach had, had came back there for the when coach Iba was still there and had played for him. So still did a lot of those things. But, uh, you know, he adjusted, you know, I, I, you know, after I had left, he he made some adjustments and started playing a little bit faster. And before it was more ball control. And he realized that we got to play fast to score. You got to try to get 70 points. And we all know that young players want to go to the NBA. So if you're if you're playing slow and scoring 50, it's going to be harder to get those guys. So if you play faster and get 70s or 80s, maybe you can get some of those players. So he adjusted with the times. And you go back and look at his career uh, and the success that he had. Um, I don't have the stats right here in front of me, but you're talking about going to a Final Four in the 70s, I believe, with Arkansas, and then to come back and do it in the 90s, and then uh, 2004, I think. He, he went to uh, three Final Fours, I think, in four different decades. And so that's showing success, but showing the – showing the ability to adapt because we know how the game changes and so how players change. Absolutely. That's an excellent point. And before we talk about some of those players that were around at Oklahoma state in those two seasons that you were part of the Cowboys program, just talk about Gallagher Iber arena. Obviously um, it has been 13, 13 and a half thousand for nearly two decades or so now since they upgraded it to uh, same time as they did uh, with Boone Pickens stadium. But just talk about um, back in those days on what is roughly 6,400 in several different nicknames, the Madison Square Garden of the Plains, the rowdiest arena in the country. Uh, talk about Gallagher. Special place. You know, I've seen it on TV, but TV does no justice. You walk in there on a normal day and it almost looked like a big high school gym. And uh, it's crazy. Uh, it was uh, how packed it would be. And like you said, about 6,500 when I get there, we well, got there, we had the a big non-conference uh, home winning streak because teams didn't, you know, you didn't play there very often. It's hard to have success, but it was, it was jam packed Cowboys everywhere. The students were in both corners there and they were packed on the floor and on the loudest places I've ever been around um, that with the Bedlam series, which is Oklahoma as you know, obviously we're talking to Barry Trammell was just another level when that game was being played. And at that time, Calvin Sampson was a coach at Oklahoma and came in there and no love lost in that series at all. But, place very very hard for other teams to come and play I remember that uh my first year there because coincidentally was the first year of the big 12 and uh I remember Baylor came in and Harry Miller was the coach and uh had a young assistant named Billy Gillespie at the time who's done pretty well and uh you know they came in and they were trying to call the plays from the bench and our guys were just running by and taking the ball because you can't hear and so obviously we use play cards we had you know, play cards that we hold up with the names of the plays on. And if you didn't come there all the time, you wouldn't know that. And so that's just a little little intricacy that you had to deal with. So special place, great fans. And our coach was really a part of that. Obviously, we're packing it out. OSU needed more revenue and talked about building a new arena, but didn't want to give up the home court and the magic and all the history. So it's kind of a unique deal where they basically, um, they basically went up. They went up, not out, went up and added another section and added a roof and then came and, and removed the roof that was there without hurting the floor. I think that's original floor from 1942, the Maple Floor is still in there. And so really unique situation, kind of goes straight up, uh, but that's what they did to 
I kind of preserved the tradition there, but they needed those additional seats to double that capacity to, you know, bring in more revenue to the athletic department. Yeah, I, I'm very big on preserving tradition like that to whenever possible. And uh, I loved it when they decided to do that rather than building a new arena. No doubt. And the fans did too, and it's right there on campus. It's actually right there by the football stadium. So they basically butt up against each other. They have some, uh, they've added on some stuff. Now they actually have some suites that I think are connected to both of them. And just a unique situation right there in the middle of Stillwater and uh, small town, small town America, but special place. And a lot of pride with Cowboy fans and the Pokes. One of the top talents that was on the team when you were there, um, as it turned out, because you were there early in his career, uh, was Desmond Mason and went on to 10 or 11 years in the NBA where he was very successful, you know, averaging about 12 and five, something like that. But you were there during his freshman and sophomore seasons as a freshman. Um, and part of the reason I thought this is because of today's college basketball environment, how quick guys are to transfer. But he, he had about four or five points a game and two or three rebounds. Um, and I'm sure you probably saw the promise. But then his sophomore year, he averaged 14 or 15 a game and about eight boards. So just talk about Desmond. And I know he was a very explosive leaper. Great player, great person. You know, we were there actually first year together. My first year was his freshman year. And it came in. I remember watching him do an individual workout with Randall Dickey, one of our assistant coaches. And uh, he got through and said, what do you think? And I said, wow, he's really athletic. He's really talented. He's, uh, I guess, kind of country strong, really. Uh, but I said, he doesn't shoot it very well. He doesn't dribble very well. He's got a long way to go. And he goes, you're exactly right. But uh, obviously, tremendous talent out of uh, out of Texas and came in and worked hard and coached Sutton coached him. And, you know, not great stats his first year. Second year was a little bit better, but really kind of took off his junior and senior year. I remember that freshman year. We had a, uh, we called it the Cowboy Bash. It was basically a midnight madness version on a Saturday night that we did to try to, you know, let the students meet our players in uh, the slam dunk contest that night. Desmond not only had a great dunk, but he shattered the backboard. And so that kind of started his legacy right off the bat. But he had to learn to play. You know, he was more of a dunker, offensive rebound score guy early. And he had to learn to work on his ball handling, work on his shooting, and actually became a good player. And made himself a very good player for Oklahoma State and you know, went to the NBA, won the slam dunk contest that one year and uh, has done very, very well. But he's a very, very raw player, but he had tremendous determination and grit from his family, his dad. And, uh, you know, he, he let Coach Sutton coach him. And that's what Coach used to tell him. If you'll let me coach you and make you better, uh, you may not like me every day, but I, I'm going to get you to be as good as you can where you got a future to make some money in this game. During those first couple seasons, uh, while Desmond was developing, uh, one of the team standouts and probably top players was Adrian Peterson. When you think Adrian Peterson, a lot of folks, of course, think the running back from Oklahoma, but um, two-time All-Big 12 performer. Uh, what are your memories of him? Great player. You know, I came in and was with him and just a guy that Arkansas could shoot it as good as anybody ever been around and uh, was with him those two years and led us in scoring and shooting. And, um, after his senior season was doing workouts and everything was getting ready. I don't know if it was in the, in the draft camp, but was doing a workout and actually broke his leg, broke his leg Achilles major, major in, uh, injury because he was forecasted to be picked uh, to be in the NBA draft and uh, really unfortunate derailed his career, but great college player, great person. And uh, you know, he was our best, our leading scorer at the time. Anyone who follows college basketball, uh, very familiar with the name Doug Gottlieb, uh, so talk about him transferring in from Notre Dame. Uh, obviously, he had to sit out, but then once he got on the court, um, he made an impact off the bat in distributing the basketball. I, I was watching some old highlights of him today when I was preparing for this interview, and uh, man, some of the some of the passes that he made, um, some you know three quarter court alley oops almost, uh, just beyond half court to uh, to Desmond. Doug was a great player. You know, his ironically, his dad, Bob, had coached under Coach Sutton, went on to be a head coach at Jacksonville. So that was our connection there. And he left Notre Dame, was out at a junior college in California. I remember when he came on his visit, like yesterday, and came on and, you know, a little guy, not very big, strong guy, but short. Uh, you know, he's a talker, as we all know, and he wouldn't tell you any different. But uh, Doug just, uh, he loved to compete. He loved to play. And it, what people don't really understand is he worked really hard. Uh, it didn't come easy to him. He had to really work on every part of the game. Uh, he was a tough guy. He worked on his defense. He was a great passer. Uh, he had to work on his shooting. He got better and became a pretty good set shooter, but great driver, great passer, assist guy, 
uh, struggle with his free throws, but it wasn't because he didn't work at it. But he was just a guy that you wanted on your team, uh, kind of the straw that stirs to drink. Uh, he made everybody kind of better. He kind of pushed you. He gave you the, you know, Bubba, if he needed some support, he'd give you some support. If, if I needed somebody to kind of get on to me a little bit, he would get on to me too. So he wasn't afraid to ruffle feathers. He wasn't trying to be the most popular. He wanted to be the quarterback of the team and he wanted to win. And uh, he's one of the most competitive guys I've ever been around and uh, uh, had great success at Oklahoma State. A big reason just because of his heart and his uh, intestinal fortitude, so to speak. Yeah, it's funny you brought up um, his love of talking because I saw that several folks were just talking about how he had the gift of gap. D Doug's a talker. He's a sports guy, and you know he knows history. He keeps up with things, and uh, he'll argue with you in a minute about who played better last night in the stat line and this or that. And uh, you better bring it because he's going to have his stuff and everything. But those are sometimes guys you need on the team. Like I said, he wasn't trying to be the most popular or the most liked, but he demanded your respect. And he raised the level of everybody's work ethic. And like I said, it's, it's not easy knowing when to, to pick a guy up or when to push a guy when he's not working hard enough. And that's a fine line. But he had a very, very good temperament and, as I say, temperature on how to do that. And, and I relate that back to, you know, being around his dad, who was a Division One coach and a great, just a Bob Gottlieb, unfortunately, has passed away, but a great, great coach and leader in the game. And Doug and still currently ranks, I think it's 11th all time in career assists. And, and, and I know his final two seasons, he was up there, you know, eight and a half, nine assists per ball game. Not many people would rather get assists and win than, have, than be the leading scorer and make a shot to win the game. But I dare say, Doug, I think he had some 15, 18 point assist games. Doug was that that type of player. And so just a just a winner, just a winner and really uh you know, California kid, California guy coming out to Stillwater and uh, not a lot of bright lights and just focus on basketball and books and gave him a second chance as, as well from Notre Dame. And uh, he really, really thrived in that success. So after your two year stint in Stillwater, talk about what's next. Uh, I know you went to, to Maryland Eastern Shore. Um, was that a was that a move from, you know, an administrative position to, to on the court? Yeah, hard to leave. I had a chance, had a mutual friend, had a chance to go out to University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, which is in the MEAC, uh, to work for Lonnie Williams. Basically made a double jump. So at that time, I was an administrative assistant, or would be like the director of operations today, and only the top two assistants could recruit. So I got a chance to basically jump from the number four assistant to second assistant and just thought it was something I couldn't pass up uh, to get some recruiting experience and keep moving up in my coaching career. So went out and did that, uh, had a fun year, learned a lot. Uh, obviously, Coppin State, North Carolina a and were very good teams uh, at that time. And ironically, was only there a year. And then one of our assistants from Oklahoma State, Paul Graham, who I'd worked with for two years, uh, he got the head job at Washington State. And uh, he asked me to come out there with him. Uh, Randall Dickey, who had been on our staff, James Dickey's brother, had went out there too. So well, I went out there, couldn't pass it up, chance to be Pac-10, and was a third assistant at the time, so couldn't recruit. I just couldn't pass up the chance to being the Pac-10 at the time at 26 years old. And so basically three of us on that team from Oklahoma State two years ago went out there and uh, had a lot of fun, some good experiences. We caught the league at a really, really tough time. I think there were over 40 NBA players at the time. And, you know, Stanford and Arizona were top five in the country. Uh, Steve Lab was at UCLA rocking and rolling. Ernie Kent had Oregon move, going very, very well. So unfortunately we caught the league at a tough time and uh, did not have, was not able to have some success, lost her job four years later. Uh, then I took a job at Martin Methodist College, small school, NAI, uh, just south of Nashville. Uh, just a chance to be a head coach and uh, Jeff Bain, the athletic director, hired me and got a chance to go in there at 30 years old and kind of do some things that I wanted to do and um, couldn't pass up that opportunity. Obviously, I needed a job too because I was out and uh, we were fortunate to win the conference championship the first year, which had never been done in school history and go back to Kansas City to the NAI National Tournament in Municipal Auditorium. So that was a lot of fun. Did that again for the next year. But I really messed with Division I, uh, just the coaching camaraderie and the prestige and everything, and was trying to find the right fit. And uh, UTEP had a position, uh, Doc Saller, who'd actually been a student manager for Coach Sutton in Arkansas. And I had knew him and met him at Oklahoma State when we played Arizona State. But uh, uh, he was out there. Randall Dickey, who I'd worked with at Oklahoma State and Washington State, both was on that staff. So I actually went out there, but ironically, the uh, only position they had at the time was a GA position. Uh, but I was still, you know, relatively young, 32, older, I guess, but single, no kids or anything. And I was like, let me make this move. And 
I could work on my doctorate. And it was also their first year in Conference USA. And that really appealed to me because that's where I'd started at Southern Mass. We're going to be back playing a lot of teams in the Southeast. And, you know, I want to get back in that area eventually. And uh, they had a great team. They got in the NCAA tournament. Uh, Coach Sadler had followed Billy Gillespie, had gone on to Texas A&M and uh, went out there. And we had great success there. Went to the NIT, just missed the uh, NCAA tournament. Memphis got the bid over us, obviously, with Coach Calipari and the success that they were having. But Mike Anderson was at UAB, Tom Penner's at Houston, very, very good league. And was there for a year. And then Coach Sadler got a chance to go to Nebraska. And uh, it was late, right before school. Uh, but I followed him up there and, uh, you know, got a chance to work with him and be back in the Big 12 where I had at Oklahoma State until the last year, I guess, we, you know, we made the move over to the Big 10. Yeah, we'll talk more about Coach Sadler and your association with him at UTEP, Nebraska, and obviously Southern Miss here in a moment. But kind of uh, working backwards just for a moment, and you talked about your time in Pullman at Washington State. Um, that has been a very challenging place to win. Um, you know, even Dick Bennett, uh, his three seasons there prior to Tony taking over, um, were all three losing seasons. And then uh, Tony went in there and won 26, 26, and 17. And I'm sure that foundation that his father had laid uh, certainly contributed to that um, without a doubt. But And then his the three seasons after uh, Tony had left for UVA, uh, they won 16, 22, and 19. But that was 2011, 2012, um, the last time that they had a winning season. And th this year they are 14 and 10. Yeah, very, very tough job. Good place, great people. You know, if you if you did a makeup of the Pac-10 or now the Pac-12, and if you try to look, start looking at maybe who doesn't belong on paper and Washington State and Oregon State kind of come to mind, only because, not being negative, only because of the size of the, of the towns. They're college towns. They're more like the SEC and the Big 12, where everything else is huge from Phoenix to uh, Tucson to L.A. to uh, Oakland, Palo Alto, those areas, Seattle. And so it's just a different different deal. And so they're very tough jobs. You can win there. It is hard to get it going. It's hard to, to sustain it. I mean, Calvin Sampson had some great success there, and then he left for Oklahoma. George Rowling was there back in the day who had some great success. But there's been some great coaches there. Kevin Eastman had trouble getting it going. Uh, Ken Bone had it going a little bit, but you made a great point that not many Hoops fans know. Uh, Dick Bennett could be argued as one of the top 20, 25 coaches of all time, and he did not have a winning season there, and he had taken Wisconsin to the Final Four. And uh, obviously he, you know, took some of the brunt of it and developed players and had, had people sitting out, and uh, Tony, great coach, but, you know, was able to coach them towards junior or senior status, but not an easy job. And still not that way today, but great place, great, great people, but way out there in the Northwest, uh, not easy recruiting there. You know, L.A. is another planet away and going to Midwest or Texas to get players is two planets away. So not an easy place, but uh, um, they, they love their basketball. They really do. So during your time at Nebraska, um, you guys had a decent amount of success and, that, and that's a program. I remember back growing up, um, they had had success and it was Danny Knee, uh, but um, under Coach Knee, um, they they did well. But um, at times, Nebraska basketball is certainly uh, you know, taking a back seat, uh, undoubtedly, to everything going on there. When you think of Nebraska, you think of football. So just talk about how challenging that was to, to build a program there with the Cornhuskers. Great place, special place, great people. Obviously, football, uh, Coach uh, Devaney and Coach Osborne put that place on the map with all their success there. And uh, Coach Need did have some success there. Tyrone Lou played there and obviously going on to do well in the coaching ranks now. But just a tough place. Not a lot of great basketball players in that area, so you have to go get them. And that doesn't always mean it's a tough job, but a lot of times it does because it's hard going into somebody else's backyard and getting players. And But uh, we had good facilities, good support staff as far as training table, academic center, all the – all the bells and whistles, but it's just a long way to get people up there. Very, very cold. Obviously, you're fortunately playing inside, but still, if you're trying to recruit Texas players and they have a chance to play at one of the Big 12 Texas teams, they may more apt to that because they're closer to home and closer to the family. So, uh, and we had some success. We went in there the first year right before the season, had a winning record. The next two seasons had great success. I believe 18 and 20, 20 wins those two years. And Went to the NIT, just, you know, we're kind of on the bubble. You know, the back, at that time, the Big 12 was 16 games. So kind of the unwritten rule was you had to get the 9-7 in league play to get to the NCAA tournament. And we just, we were 7-9. and nine. We just couldn't get over that quite hump. Uh, we slumped a little bit the fourth year, came back the fifth year, had some great success. 
uh, was, you know, again, in play down the stretch to maybe go to the NCAA tournament, had uh, big home wins over Texas A&M and Mark Turgeon in Texas with uh, uh, Rick Barnes, who were both top 25 teams at the time, came up a little bit short and uh, ended up one of the, playing the NIT and played Wichita, I guess, that year, kind of when Greg Marshall was getting going. So three years overall there in the NIT, which we wanted more, and then we made the adjustment to the Big Ten, which was a financial decision for the school and a good decision in great league. But obviously when you're at big schools and you make that change and you leave that last year in the big 12, you know, you're leaving and everybody else does. And the new year you come in, you're learning everything new. And so you're in the big 10, you're going to new cities, new arenas, playing new coaches, new schemes. Uh, big 10 is totally different than the big 12. They're both great leagues, but they're totally different. And the fans and the, Obviously, the Big Ten has led the country in the tennis the last 30 years, totally different environments and stuff, and went in there, really struggled there that first year, and uh, unfortunately, we did not get a second uh, second opportunity in the Big Ten. So that was that was disappointing, but also price of the deal. But again, had some good success there over three years, and you know, three three NITs, we did come up short on going to the NCAA tournament, which is which was our goal. And um, I know Coach Miles got him one year. And ironically, one side note is that I was talking to a former our, our beat writer today, Lee Barthnack with Omaha World Herald. But, you know, Nebraska is still one of the teams, the few teams that's never won an NCAA tournament game. And so it's a good job. And it's a tough job, though. And Coach Harburg, you know, is a great coach. We'll get it going. But Nebraska has still never won an NCAA tournament game. And that's kind of hard to believe. Yeah, it is. Uh, unfortunately, Nebraska is right there with my Pirates, who who have just made uh, two appearances all time in the, in the NCAA tournament, and the last one coming in 1993. Hard to win games at any level, as we know. Hard to win games, but great place, great support there. And obviously, when we were leaving, they built a new arena downtown. We had a new practice facility that opened up while we were there, and so they have some great facilities and great setup. And the player, the talent level has improved there. There's been some. Uh, more uh, developed college players in both Lincoln and Omaha now. And there's some really, really good players in Iowa and Casey and Minneapolis, but you still have to Nebraska. You got to go to the players. They're not in your backyard like some places may have them. So after that uh, experience there at Nebraska, I know Coach Sadler, I believe, joined Fred Hoiberg's staff at Iowa State. Uh, what was next for you before you had the opportunity to, to join Coach Sadler in Hattiesburg and come home to Southern Miss? Yeah, I actually set out the next year. During that last year, my wife was going, fiance at the time, we know wife was going through some tough things and tough battle for cancer. So uh, kind of hit the reset button, a chance to help take care of her, and try to get her better. So did that. Try to get back into coaching the next year and chased a couple of things. Almost got a chance to go to Virginia Tech in an operations spot, but came up short. And actually, I took a teaching job at Southern Indiana and uh, got a chance. You know, I got my doctorate at uh, UTEP and was still intrigued about that in administration, maybe as an AD. But took the teaching job and did that for the year and kind of went to watch a lot of practices, a lot of games, spent a lot of time with Rodney Watson, who was the head coach of Southern Indiana. Uh, you know, they had great success. You know, Bruce Pearl had been there before and won the national championship and a uh, big time league in the Great Lakes Valley. So went to watch a lot of games and, you know, uh, uh, Southern Indiana's in Evansville. So you're three hours from St. Louis, you're three hours from Nashville, Bowling Green's pretty close, Indianapolis. So call a lot of practices and games and just try to network and, was chasing jobs, so to speak. And ironically, the next year, uh, Coach Sattler uh, got the job at Southern Miss, which ironically was my alma mater, where I started with Coach Turk. And, uh, you know, I'd been fortunate to work with Coach Sattler at UTEP and Nebraska both. So it uh, kind of worked out where I could go back home and, you know, work for a guy that I had already had worked for. Going back home, um, very challenging situation, to say the least. Um, Golden Eagles, um, you know, had – different NCAA, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly everything that was going on, but you know, I'll, I'll let you briefly touch on that to what you guys were walking into. And I know year one, uh, you only won, I think, three ball games. Yeah, a tough situation. We walked into the situation, the previous coach, there had been an investigation started soon after we got there and there was some uh, allegations of academic fraud and some other improprieties. And so investigation started uh, that first year we were playing and a certain place were suspended or declared NLs by the time. I think we ended up, I think we really had, I think we had nine, we ended up having to forfeit some back to three or four, but we basically won nine games that year and we had self-imposed a, a postseason ban that year, which was tough, but you know, we weren't going to go to the postseason anyway, but once you take that dream away from winning three games in three days, it's not easy. Uh, investigation continued in the second year. Our athletic director made a decision to do another 
self-imposed postseason ban, which was unheard of and never been done. So our first two years, we had no chance to go to postseason. Again, we, we weren't very good and not saying we could have gone to postseason, but when you take that allure of hope around, it's very tough. And so we're recruiting a uh, very difficult call and trying to get players, but you know, they want to go to the NCAA tournament too. And so we struggled a little bit there. Uh, finally got our penalties there. It was a, a, a probation deal. And um, I think the first three years or my three years there, we were nine, nine wins, eight wins, nine wins. And then uh, we had some players sitting out and obviously had some success. I jumped over to a teaching position and Coach Seller had some success the last four, last two years and the 117 and the last year won 20 games went to postseason. Ironically, was still on postseason, still on probation from the NCAA at the time. So very tough deal, but uh, obviously you have to do what's right and do things the right way. And uh, the school and everyone else pays for it when things are not. So we just, we try to make the most, most of it, but it was not an easy situation for any of us. Yeah. And that's one of the things that really stood out. And you talked about winning 20 ball games, you know, you know, five years span or so five or six years span you went from three wins to 20 wins yeah not easy you know you gotta get players and you know again players want to go to the NCAA postseason they want to be on tv they want to be in March Madness they want to hear one shining moment uh they know more people are watching those games including scouts and the NBA guys so their stock goes up and you know we as we always said you know hopefully if we're coaching get a lot of chances at it a player gets four shots at it if they're a juco player they get two shots at it and so you understand their situation if they go to another team that has a chance, two chances to get in, and you're only going to have one out of two. And so you understand that. You feel bad, and you you want the player, but uh, we all have to make the best decisions for ourselves in life. And so we we missed out on some players that we liked, and uh, we got some that we probably need a little bit better. But, you know, you, you got to get what you can get and coach them up, do the best you can, and you just, you know, you kind of keep the bus moving. Kind of shifting gears a bit now, uh, Chris, you know, for the last 11 plus months, and we, we've been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in both uh, drawing on your coaching experience and background there, but then also uh, now uh, in the academic uh, setting, just talk about what that's been like, um, you know, specifically, you know, with your background, a lot of it being as a director of operations, talk about what those guys have been going through with um, trying to trying to schedule flights on the spur of the moment, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm glad I'm not in it anymore. And when I talk to them, they tell me situations and ask me, I said, I have no idea. You know, there's no blueprint. And I, I told a couple of friends last week, I said, I hope you're taking notes, uh, keeping a diary. I hope you write a book. Uh, now nobody may read it until the next pandemic in the next 100 years. Um, but it's a, it's an uncertain time, uncharted waters. Uh, nobody, what's gonna, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, if you look back to last March, we're, I guess, about three weeks away from when things happen. And uh, basically, just we just hit pause. We just hit pause on planet Earth, including the United States of America. And um, obviously, things had to happen for different reasons for that, for safety and welfare of people. But uh, sports just stopped. And uh, it's important in our lives, but uh, it's a small piece of it as well. And so, uh, you know, you, you try to move on. You think back, we weren't sure if we we're going to have a college football season. We weren't sure how the basketball season is going to go and knock on wood. Uh, March Madness is going to be totally different this year, but hopefully it happens for lots of reasons for the coaches and players, but obviously for the NCAA and the money and all the spring sports. So there's just so many moving parts. You know, we're talking a little bit before we went on the air about how attendance is changing in different states now. And so it's one of those things you just, I hate to say, you got to kind of get, get through the day, try to win the day and plan for tomorrow. But, you can have seven, eight contingency plans for tomorrow. None of them may work because of what you've been having to deal with. And so, uh, again, uncharted waters and um, there's no textbook or no class or seminar that can help anybody for this. Yeah, like you're saying, um, as a coach, you always want to have those contingency plans. But um, I guess this year it's been so, so crazy and not being able to have, you know, a plan, plan FGH, et cetera. <laughs> that I've heard so many coaches just talk about the importance of focusing on what they do. That's all you can do. You've seen some crazy situations where teams are out for a couple of weeks and trying to make up games. I know here at Southern Miss we're 25% capacity. So a lot of fans haven't been able to go to games and uh, they've, we've been fortunate just to have one game canceled, but uh, just the uncertainty, you know, players and coaches going through testing, you know, every day or a couple of times a week and not knowing, you know, you're getting ready to play and, you got the scout report ready, but you know, to be honest, you got to have everybody on there because 
if their two best players are out, then the other guys are playing. So it's just a, it's a different, different dilemma that we've never been through. And, um, you know, hopefully, as I say in class, uh, hope none of us go through it again in our lifetime. Um, but it is what it is. You kind of make the best of it. And we've come a long way since last uh, March, April, and May, June, when there was no sports to when the NBA got back going in the bubble. And Major League Baseball did it with no fans. And then NFL did it in college. And we made a lot of progress. And hopefully we're uh, going to keep inching forward. And hopefully this fall, I don't know about normal, but maybe we're semi-normal and continue to make some progress for, for everybody. I know one of the things you talk about um, w with your students is um, sport finance. So just talk about, <laughs> there's so many different ways this could go, but just um, states having limited attendance, some no fans, some um, ev everywhere is significantly reduced. Just talk about the impact of all that stuff and you know, some of the points you've been making with your students. Um, and you brought up March Madness. I think what it it generally is at least like 650 or 700 million dollars, if not more. And last year, um, it was what right there, a little less than third. three million. Yeah, third. Yeah, yeah. You know, totally uncharted waters. You know, I think what people forget is that pro and college sports is a business, and they're putting products out there and letting us watch games on TV or in person. They're business. They got bills to pay. They got to pay the players salaries and scholarships and all those things. So when everything shut down for us it shut down for them too. And so that's unfortunate and you got to get things back going for the economy, for, for jobs and different things there. But those, those professional sport organizations have taken a bath in how much money they've lost. I mean, think back to think that NBA spent $153 million on the bubble last year and they pulled it off, but think about the teams not going to play those remaining games at home. Uh, think back to major league baseball. They got to play the shortened 60 plus games, whatever they played, but with no fans at all. I mean, they have their announcers not even traveling. They're back at the home park watching the game on TV and just announcing to you and I. And so a lot of different crazy things were done. Obviously, NFL, when you saw the NFL, some, some teams had different capacities. So there's no fans at some games and some have some. We've seen that transcend to college basketball and college football too. So all kinds of situations. Um, obviously, if people can't go to games and spend that money, uh, we're close to the Saints. So I use that example, you know, Saints sell out every game. You can't get a ticket. And now they had no fans and then they had four or 5,000. Think about the ticket sales they're losing, the parking, the concessions, the sale of alcohol, the licensed merchandise, uh, the economic impact of the city from the hotels, the restaurants, the bars, the museums. I mean, it's just a domino effect, Bubba. And uh, it, it, it's no stop. It's you can kind of put a bandaid and get things back the other way. So uh, no college athletic departments have had to deal with it. Um, obviously, when March Madness shut down last year, most people don't understand this. When March Madness basically shut down that Friday, about 48 hours, 72 hours later, they canceled all the spring sports. And I remember some friends of mine saying, you know, why are they doing that? Why don't we wait and try to start back playing in May or June? There's still a lot of time for the College World Series. And most fans don't understand that March Madness pays for all the championships except for football. And so when you lost March Madness, you lost that payday. They had some insurance and got about a third of the money. But you lost your money to fund beach volleyball, tennis, golf, the World Series. You lost a funding of that. So that wasn't going to happen because of a financial reason, maybe more so than the health reason that we didn't know. And so I don't think that's what sometimes the, uh, the common fan understands how big March Madness is. And like this year, they moved it to Indy, 68 teams. They got to pull it off. They got to pull it off safely. They got to do some stuff to make the TV revenue and sponsorship money. And if they don't, for some reason, then unfortunately, the spring sports could suffer again because, again, that funds all those NCAA championships. And so it's just a it's a domino effect. It's a domino effect. And uh, again, think of college towns and cities that are hurting financially because they haven't had people go to those games. And so, um, you know, small restaurant owners and hotels and bars and shopping centers and, and the like. So uh, hopefully we're going to get back to some normalcy sooner than later, but it's been a tough, been a tough year, year and a half. Hopefully it's not two years for a lot of people in the business world. Yeah. Speaking of tough, I certainly don't envy the NCAA tournament selection committee's job this year. You know, some teams, I think when you have the 13 game minimum, um, some teams right now have played as few as, maybe nine to 12 games. And then there are some that have played 20 plus. going to be totally different this year with the eye, eye test to say the least. And um, you're going to have to pick the best teams you can. And 
you know, unfortunately, I hope we don't. We may have some situations where they start the testing and say, you know, I got a couple of players that test positive and we can't have enough to play and we're supposed to play you and you get to advance and we don't, we go home and don't even get to play. And you hope that doesn't happen, but they're going to have to keep that thing on track because of the dates, and the deadlines and the CBS contract. And, you know, I know people say we'll push it back. Well, the Masters is set next week. You know, that's the slot. He is, CBS is paying the money. And they want it to go forward if it can go on safely. So you may have some teams that get to the final four that maybe don't have to even play four games. They may only have to play three games to get there because one of their opponent drops out because of COVID-19. And nobody hopes that, but that could happen. Sticking with the financial theme, uh, one of the major topics in NCAA athletics, um, you know, especially um, in, impact in, in football and men's basketball, but but it certainly impacts the others as well as the NIL legislation. So having the unique um, perspective of a former coach of nearly 20 years, but then also now um, the academic side and uh, seeing these student athletes on a daily basis in class or, you know, on a multi time a week basis, at least. Uh, what are your, what are your thoughts on the NIL legislation um, on a number of levels as far as um, just, just in general, the implementation and so on? You know, it's coming. It's coming soon to a school near you. I know NAI has already started. It's coming. It's going to happen. Um, the student athletes deserve it. They deserve a piece of the pie. They put a lot of work and time into it. And a lot of people making money off their uh, their name, success, jersey, face, different things like that. I think you have to be very careful, though, when you launch it. you got to be very organized and very meticulous and make sure you're prepared once you put it in. Because I think there are some negative parts of it. Uh, you know, it's not going to affect all student athletes and all student athletes don't even understand that it's going to be a very, very small percentage. So let's let's take a football team, for example. Uh, the quarterback may get a commercial uh, for a four dealership in town. Those offensive linemen probably aren't getting that commercial. And so you're going to create some teams. You're going to create some situations within individual teams and within the athletic department where student athletes now see each other differently and some are getting more money and they're all a part of the team and their own scholarship, but that's something they're not really all seeing. You start doing the uh, making the money off there, they're going to maybe see cash in the hand. And so I think it's a delicate situation. Uh, you got to figure out how you're going to uh, handle some things there. You got some situations with some sports, maybe uh, racial situations, making more money, some title nine situations is too. And so you got a lot of different situations that you got to look at. And I think one thing that people also, I you know I've talked with our athletic director here, Jeremy McLean about is this could per, per se to you and your area, East Carolina, you know, every school has people that raise money. Ours is the Eagle club. Well, if NLI goes in effect, let's say the local car dealership owner who gives the Eagle club a hundred thousand dollars for scholarships, he may cut that down to 50,000 now because he's given the other 50,000 directly to football to do commercials or advertisements for the star players. And so that's a positive for the football team and the players to use, but that's going to be a negative back on the athletic department. So I think there's a lot of issues there. This comes into play that you got to figure out some answers. Uh, take it back to Johnny Menzel at Texas A&M when he had great success. I believe he was number 12. And so if you're selling number 12 jerseys, uh, Menzel should get that money. But Bubba, what about you? If you're number 12 that play on defense, you know, college football teams are so big, they have multiple numbers. You just can't have two people on the field at the same time. But what about if you're playing defense and you're number 12 with no name on the back? We know they're probably buying that jersey for Manziel, but you could argue you're number 12 too. Uh, what happens when Manziel leaves the next year and I come in as a new freshman, I get the number 12 jersey and they're still selling like hotcakes. They're really buying them for Manziel, but I wear the jersey now. Do I not get the money or does the money still go to, to, to Manziel even though he's gone? So those are all questions. I don't have the answers for him. But again, I, I think it's going to happen. It is fair. It is good. It's going to be for student athletes. But, but I do think that you have to get some people in the room, the commissioners, the ADs, some former student athletes, some people who understand things and answer some of these questions before you move forward. Or if not, you could have total chaos and it's already out there. And, you know, once you put it in and the schools start doing it the way they want to do it, uh, I think the last part of that is going to be used as, as a recruiting advantage. And I think you're going to see schools to start using that and recruiting advantage. I've heard of some football places now, director of operations, are trying to hire guys with sport, sport, uh, sport law degrees. And that's, I assume, to help put contracts together. 
And so you're going to start changing the dyna dynamics of recruiting a little bit. If Alabama football is recruiting guy and so is Auburn, they're – in our NIL deals they can put together to get that star player because they're trying to win games. Yeah, like you're saying, there's so many uh, ripple effects of it. You bring up an excellent point as far as kind of the, the reappropriation of the funds. And uh, um, if, if X company has $100,000 or whatever amount of money that they're going to spend, uh, exactly how are they going to spend it? So it's certainly and, and again, intriguing to see how it all plays out. It, again, it needs to happen. It needs to happen. It's fair for the student athletes, but there's a lot of questions that need to be figured out where you're trying to be fair to teams and student athletes and um, how you're going to police it. You got to be able to police it where it doesn't open up a, a Pandora's box of uh, illegal recruiting. You know, speaking of fair, um, something else I know, I know you're passionate about and you, you've written, um, I guess, chapters out of a book on it. Uh, talk about some of the things that we've experienced over, I guess, over the last seven or eight months now. Uh, and obviously they're always present, but they've been even, even heightened in the last eight months or so with social issues. Yeah, obviously it's been around a long time. I think obviously uh, social media now, there's so many networks, it's more publicity. Obviously last year was a presidential election, so heightened tense uh, for everyone. But uh, some unfortunate situations that have been involved, uh, wrote a book chapter uh, Black males in athletics and higher education, uh, exploration of the issues and solutions with Dr. James Satterfield, who was my advisor at UTEP. So, you know, the, the black male oftentimes has been exploited uh, for football or men's basketball because they're great players. They try to coach them or make them better and get them to the league or whatever. But the other things are not done where they got the academic support they need. They don't get the training they need or technique or learn some of the different life skills. So I think there's there's been a, a more recent surge by the NCA and some different things on diversity to make sure they have some things in place on each campus to help those underrepresented groups. And they could be Hispanic groups or female groups, international groups. So you need to make sure that you're educating your student athlete database and you're preparing them for life because they all want to go on and play and have some success. And some do, but they also don't understand there's a time limit. We, we all have an expiration on how long we get to play, um, you know, college athletics and even professional athletics. And so you need to be teaching some life lessons of how to handle their money, how to do insurance, how to do checkbooks, how to pay bills, uh, how to conduct themselves in networking and mentoring deals. And those are all things that are important. Again, it goes back to life lessons that I talked about, Coach Sutton and Coach Turk, and so many coaches do, but not all of them do. So I think those are things that are very, very important uh, where you're helping groups. And just like this last year, a lot of controversial issues, but uh, teaching people how to communicate. You know, every uh, there's lots of challenges in life and uh, every culture, race, gender, a geographical area faces different ones, but you need to show people how to communicate and discuss things and do it safely and professionally where uh, once you start discussions, then you can start talking about change. And uh, just because you say you won't change doesn't mean it's going to happen. Just because you say we need it or we're going to fight it or, or protest or riot, there's, there's right ways to do things, but you need to look at how to change things for the betterment of the sport and all the players involved including the different various races or genders. And I think you've seen some great examples this past year of some different athletes who have done that and realized they can use their platform. They can use their voice on social just on social injustice and social media uh, for people to see different sides. Again, we all come from different backgrounds and uh, we see things from kind of our standpoint, but we need to look at it from other points of view too. And uh, again, most importantly, as I say, just make things better. Let's try to make things better. Yeah, that's an excellent point regarding the communication, you know, respect, communication, understanding. I mean, like, even if you don't uh, understand someone's viewpoint, um, doing your best to put yourself in their situation to see it how they see it, even if you're never going to see it that way. And then it's okay to disagree. No doubt. And it happens. And I'm teaching a social ethical issues class right now in a grad class. And you know, 40, 50 students in there, very diverse, uh, different genders, different races, different cultures, international. And we talk about some uh, some um, challenging topics in there from race to gender, to youth sports, to commercialization, to violence. And, you know, as I say, we're going to we're going to learn some stuff from the text and talk about the research. And then we can talk about some things from your lens of how you see things. But make sure when someone else talks that you listen and try to see it through their lens because your, your background and what you grow up dictates a lot of times how you see things. And, you know, 
and it's not always right, not saying you're wrong, but we need to see that from different viewpoints. And I think coaches do a great job of that because they're obviously recruiting players and getting players on teams from all different backgrounds to trying to do one thing. So I, I think coaches understand how to bring people together for a common cause. And again, communication is the first step and talking about it and figuring out how we can make things better for us. But let's think ahead down the road for our kids and their kids. And I think once you start thinking about that and, I think sometimes we all have to remind ourselves we're all Americans. We're all on Team America. Let's let's try to make things better for everyone. Yeah, no doubt about it. A couple more things for you as we're wrapping up this afternoon's conversation. Um, one of the major issues facing college coaches as far as um, specifically basketball in terms of one one and dones and then uh, transferring w- without sitting out, that that possibility. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts there? I know one and done was it was interesting. You know, players formerly could go out of high school and go straight there. Some of them were talented enough, huge jump, personally and professionally to handle everything. I think the NBA kind of figured out they weren't ready to handle all the other stuff. And so they, you know, the rule got put into place where it's one year. You know, sometimes it's kind of a travesty. Sometimes places make a joke of it. Guys not going to class and taking care of business. So, you know, that's the rule that's in place now. You know, there's been some talk about having it where you put where you stay two years. You know, currently in baseball, you can go out of high school, but they're going to the minor leagues. They're not going to major leagues off the bat, or they got to wait till after their third year. Uh, football has to wait till after their third year now. So, you know, probably needs to be a little bit longer than one year, maybe two year would be kind of a, uh, a deal there. But again, that kind of goes back to supply and demand. And uh, always unfortunately, guys leave to go early, but if they can make the money, understand it, wish them the best. And a lot of people are always concerned about the college game, which is going to struggle. Well, there's the next person up. And I think that's what's great about college basketball. If, if Bubba, you get a chance to go pro and you go pro, then maybe that's my time to shine. And so, but uh, I think, again, you got to just make sure that you're doing the right things for the student athletes to try to put them in a best situation to be successful. Because, uh, you know, going to the NBA at 19 years old, it's a huge gap to play in the older players, but the, the, the travel, playing the four games in one week, handling all the different distractions, that's a whole other thing that they're not going to be able to learn until they go through it. And so that's not always fair for them. So um, I, I think if they could increase that to maybe two years and try it and see how that works. And, um, you know, I don't know, there's some other pop-up things going on where they can go and play and not go to school. So it kind of goes back to the individual, what they're trying to do. You know, some want to get a degree and we know some are just trying to go and play one year go to class one semester and go to the NBA. And if they're good enough, they may still make it, but as I said before, there's going to be an expiration date on that playing time, too. One of the phrases you uh, hear a lot of coaches use, I know Joe Dooley at East Carolina, who has a unique experience in a, of having been um, the top assistant for Bill Self at Kansas for a number of years. Um, and Coach Dooley's always talking about getting old and staying old. And then at certain programs like Kansas, North Carolina, Kentucky, uh, you, you have one and dones that are in play, Duke, obviously. Um, but then you have programs like Gonzaga and Baylor here in recent history, or Gonzaga for a long time now. But, you know, they have very talented players, but not always those, quote, one and dones or, you know, a couple years and they're gone, uh, as some of those other programs do. So just uh, talk about how those programs are are, are able to uh, compete more and you have more parity as a result. You know, a lot of the mid-major teams that had great success because they redshirt guys and develop them, and then they're playing the seniors, the fifth-year seniors that are 23. And so then when they get in the tournament, they have some success, and we've had the different stories, I don't, you know, from the Butlers, George Mason, the Wichita, to, to Lala going to the Final Four. And I kind of bring it back to, let's say we're, we're you used to, when I coached, I ran a bat, we did summer basketball camps. Well, uh, if you take a fifth-year senior, maybe on Northern Iowa's team, he's 23, and let's say, Bubba, you're a freshman and say, let's just put you to East Carolina. You're 18. That's a five-year gap. That's a, that's a big difference. They're going to be, you know, probably bigger, stronger, maybe understand the game a little bit better. They've been through more scout reports. They play more. They understand the language more. But let's bring that back to basketball camp. Uh, I run basketball camp. Like for Doc, we had camp for five- to eight-year-olds. We had another camp from nine to ten. We would never have a five-year-old and a ten-year-old on the same court. That's a five-year gap. Well, let's go back to the other situation. You're 18 and he's 23. That's a five-year gap. So I think that's what sometimes a common fan doesn't understand. Just because you're older doesn't mean you're better, but they're just their bodies are developed. They understand the game. 
They've been through a lot of practices, a lot of scouting reports. They understand how to guard things and defend things. They understand how to handle their time. They understand how to eat and do all those other things that are so important. So it is a huge deal there uh, when you have experienced players. And again, a lot of the mid-major teams that have great success in the NCAA tournament against some blue bloods because again, that age gap and that experience. So uh, it'll be interesting kind of in the second part of that and then transfers, if the transfer rule goes into effect and players are able to transfer and play right away, it'll be interesting to see if Duke and Kentucky and some of those teams who get the one and dones, they may still do it, but do they go out and get some fifth year guys now from some top 25 teams to come play for them? So they're, as you said, grow old, stay old. They got that experience. And so just, you know, thinking, uh, give an example here, Alabama's got a great team this year. But let's say Duke goes and gets a guy from Alabama this year, go to Duke next year, and he's a fifth-year senior at Duke. Then Alabama's got to go down to get another player from somewhere else. It's going to start a food chain. So it will be interesting to see what some of those top premier teams do if the transfer rule goes into effect. Obviously, they're still going to go after some one and dons, but maybe they just get one and they focus on some of those more – older and more mature players that are really good college players, but may not be NBA stars. That's an excellent point regarding the recruitment of other universities players. And Joe Dooley said that's one of his big fears. Obviously it already happens, but it, it's going to happen even more uh, if that is in fact the case. And then um, in addition to that, uh, he said that numerous coaches have told him, Hey, if this happens, then, uh, I'm essentially going to be done recruiting high school kids. I'm just going to bring in transfers. That's an unfortunate deal. We have a guy here, a freshman here on our team, and that's what's unfortunately going to happen. Again, I'm all for student athletes and the rights and the transfer deal helps them. But uh, I think that role is going to happen too. And it appears to be great for student athletes. I, I know sometimes they think it's always greener on the other side. And so if you come in and you're not happy, you want to transfer, now you can go. What happens if you have nowhere to go and find anywhere to go play? You just lost a scholarship here to chase something on the other side you didn't even have. And so there's not going to be enough spots for everybody to just keep moving around. Um, and so the other thing is, I think the mid-major programs, if you if you spend time and get a good freshman, makes all conference freshmen. Or we've had a guy make freshman of the week a couple of times in Conference USA. There's probably a good chance those – those lower five or six SEC teams may come and get him next year because he's going to be better or more experienced than a high school or JC player they can get because they have a time limit on them trying to win too. And so you're going to, you're going to take away the old program and everybody's going to become a team. Everybody's going to try to put together the best team this year, but the old deal about building a program and sustaining it, the Desmond Mason story, those are not going to happen. And that's unfortunate will be a big blow to, to college basketball and some other sports too, but it looks like that's going to happen. That's going to, that's going to go into play. So it'll be interesting to see East Carolina, no coach Dooley in here. How much does mid major spend time and money recruiting high school players knowing if you get them and if they're good enough, you're going to lose them anyway. And so they may stop and just start doing some transfers and save some money through the year recruiting to pick up some transfers, the best available late in the year, if they get some great ones, great. They're going to be pretty good next year. What happens if they miss on a couple of them and they don't get those guys? They can probably have a bad season next year. And then they're going through it, just redoing the deal the next year. And so I think it's going to change the dynamics a lot. It could hurt some high school and junior college players. Uh, the signing days may not be near as important anymore because everybody's waiting to get transfers. And, you know, we'll go get those, those, those other players later. And when you talk about transfers, one of the things that um, three letters that always comes to mind, and I know you know what I'm talking about, APR. So just talk about that uh, final thing uh, and challenge as a, as a Division I coach um, in particular uh, when it comes to APR and um, always recruiting your players to, to stay in um, a good – good uh, on a good good standing with them I guess you could say and uh, right. make sure that they're going to be fully committed to your program and they're going to be honest with you and, and not working behind your back well the APR the academic progress report was put into play kind of as a retention deal obviously people want people to graduate but it's kind of a retention deal to keep people on pace you can get up to four points for each player each year for for, re, for being eligible and also for returning. And uh, one thing they have an answer to the transfer deal, if you put that in place, how does that do on the APR? Right now, if you go below the APR, if you lose guys because of grades or too many people transfer out, 
Uh, they take a four-year average, but if you go before, it can be banned from postseason. And so they haven't answered the question of how that, are you going to get rid of APR or how are you going to handle that? Uh, the, the other situation, the transfer deal, let's say people transfer and let's say not in the name schools, but I think there's one school that's already said they're not going to bring their coach back next year. What happens the day after the season when everybody raised that camp, there's no players there. And so the new coach comes in and he's got to sign 13 players probably can't find 13 guys good enough to fit what he's doing right now. He's going to take a huge hit on APR from losing all those players from this year. And so those are things, again, back to the NLI deal, the NCAA has got to have some answers for these things before they put these things in place. Even though they're, they're proactive for student athletes and they're going to help them, you got to have things in place to protect these coaches and teams because uh, you talk about a mad scramble of uh, people taking transfers and, um, you know, you think about handshake lines after the game, coaches telling players, hey, you know, Bubba, keep your head up. I got a, I got a spot for you next year. I mean, that's basically just making a recruiting pitch to you. And so you got a whole lot of things that are going to come up on that. And I'm afraid the player is going to always be chasing the next opportunity that's bigger and better and not enjoy the time where they're at. And coaches can't plan on recruiting. You know, if you have three seniors now and you need two guards in a big, you put that on your board and you know, you got to recruit two or three times that many to get one. Now, if it's a free transfer, you better recruit two of everything in every spot next year because you don't know who's coming back and who's not. And so you really, you really change the dynamics of building the program and getting better each year. And the fans are going to struggle too because they're going to have players they like and they're gone. And they're going to have new players come and go. It's going to be a lot of coming and going. And so I don't know if that's what the NCAA is trying to do. I think they're trying to give the student athletes some options and some rights uh, like they think coaches have, but I think you got to be very, very careful. Or you're going to open up a can of worms. Yeah. Really appreciate your time on uh, this afternoon. Before we let you go though, as we sit here on um, the 24th of February, who do you like with the, with March madness? You know, it's going to be wild. Obviously, I think everyone agrees Gonzaga and uh, Baylor up there at the top two teams. Uh, a lot of other spots open up. And I think it always goes back to March Madness. Who's playing hop at the matchups? The matchups are so important. It usually kind of would be a little bit different because where they're playing or traveling. Now they're all in Indy. So it's going to be a little bit different. But the COVID deal, unfortunately, some COVID positive tests are, are going to be huge now, too. So, uh, you know, you got to think Gonzaga and Baylor will get there just because of their track record. But you know, I don't know if you could have maybe two mid-majors on the other side. That's how crazy uh, this thing could be. And uh, it's going to be it's going to be one of the craziest uh, basketball tournaments ever, to say the least. Yeah, as much as I love the, the Cinderella story, and I, I certainly hope that there are plenty of them in this year's tournament, fingers crossed that there will be a minimal impact with in terms of uh, COVID-19 and positive tests and contact tracing, a term that I hope um, soon fades away <laughs> in the next in the next few or several months. And uh, you mentioned the handshake line. Hopefully we'll have a handshake line here soon and not and not uh, coaches looking at each other and uh, throwing their hand up. That's right. High five, the, 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 the air high five, as we used to say in camp. Yeah, no doubt. Um, but really appreciate your time. I have really enjoyed this conversation and uh, we look forward to having you back on sometime down the road. Bubba, thanks so much for the opportunity. Really enjoyed being here today and I really appreciate it. That concludes this edition of the Bubba Rose Show. We appreciate you tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you listen. Also, be sure to follow us on social media at Bubba Rosenbaum on Twitter, at Bubba Rose Show on Instagram. Like and follow the Bubba Rose Show on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let us hear from you by emailing us at thebubbaroshow at gmail.com. Again, that's thebubbaroshow at gmail.com. We'll see you next time, y'all.